Wahoo today announced the availability of this, the Wahoo Kicker Direct Connect. This makes use of the connection port on the rear of the Kicker 5 and links it straight to your home network. Now that's it in a nutshell. If you want to stick around, I'll cover what this is, what this isn't, how it works, and where I think this technology is heading. So if you've encountered dropouts on a power meter or a smart trainer indoors, you know the frustration that can cause, and this device addresses exactly that. But not in a way people have been asking for. This does not directly connect your trainer to the device that you're using your software on. Okay, onto all the technical details of how this device works. The Direct Connect hardware module is a serial to ethernet converter. It's zero configuration and should be plug and play. It also uses multicast DNS, aka bonjour in the Apple ecosystem, just like a printer to advertise its presence on a network. It uses TCP and port 36866 and is a single connection only. So once one app is connected to the kicker on the network, nothing else can wrangle control. Kind of handy that way for cross communication. Uh, multiple direct connected kickers can exist on a single network. They'll each have their own unique IP address and unique ID to connect to. The direct connect port is capable of faster communication than AMP Plus or Bluetooth, but Wahoo have locked it to 4Hz or 250 millisecond refresh rate at this point in time. There's also no authentication method with this, so once it's on your trusted network, anything or anyone can connect to it. So for trainer software support, they just simply need to update their ability to pair to these devices over the network and control the trainer via IP. Support is in its infancy across pretty much all platforms at this point in time, which is January 26th, 2021, because today is release date. They haven't had a lot of time with this. The Wahoo press release states that as of today, the Wahoo's SUF training system, aka the SUFFERFest, Trainer Road, Full Gaz, and RGT are compatible, and other platforms are expected to become compatible in the coming months, including Zwift. Even though this device is called the Kicker Direct Connect, I assume 99% of people will be connecting this to their home networks via Wi-Fi or connecting to it via Wi-Fi from their phones, their computers, or their Apple TVs. Wireless connections aren't inherently bad. It's the type of wireless connections used that can be troublesome, especially in the 2.4 gig range used by Ant Plus and Bluetooth. Here's the configuration. I've been running in the Llama Lab with the Wahoo Kicker Direct Connect. Now I don't have a switch anywhere nearby to plug the ethernet directly into, so I've plugged it directly into a Google Nest Wi-Fi access point, which converts this ethernet connection into five gig Wi-Fi. Okay, time to get nerdy in the Llama Lab just for a few moments to see what's going on on the network. Now I've got Wireshark running in the background looking for all traffic from the previously registered DHCP IP of the Wahoo Kicker Direct Connect. I've got a couple of terminal windows and I have a multicast DNS browser ready to load to see what's on the network once I turn the kicker on. So plugging the trainer in now. And we have life on the network from my Wahoo Kicker. So from 192.168.86.34, we see an IGMPv2 packet, and then we see the multicast DNS information right there on the screen. So if I load up my multicast DNS browser, my Bonjour browser, I scroll down, and what do we see right here? We see the Wahoo Kicker 6789. There we go, ready to go. And it's registered IP address 192.168.86.34 and the TCP port to connect to. So if we were to ping that address, there we go, we can see those packets, all good. Now if I was to telnet to, to that address on port 36866, we'll see that connect. Sin, sin, ack, ack, we are connected here. And if I was to try and connect again, and I said it was a single connection, so what's gonna happen here? There we go. We get a reset act back. So unable to connect from a second session. And just to show you that that works from a second session once we disconnect. There we go. It's connected just fine. And this one will get rejected. So proving there that there's only one connection available on that TCP port. Ping times, let's have a look at those again. 7711, what's that, my average? Around about four. Not bad. Back over here to my Bonjour browser and the service UUIDs that it's advertising, the 1818 I believe is Bluetooth power and 1826 is Bluetooth FTMS, which I believe is the protocol it's talking over this IP connection. I suspect the way you pair these network devices is going to be no different to how we currently pair Ant Plus and Bluetooth devices. I assume Zwift will put a little network logo here, which will then search the multicast DNS for peripherals on the network that it can connect to. 
If you're wondering why Wahoo went down the network connectivity route versus the directly connected route, such as the CompuTrainer uses, it's all about compatibility. Direct wire connections are a thing of the past. You are never going to plug a wired device into an Apple TV, an iPhone, an iPad, or most Android devices without a ton of hurdles getting in the way. It just won't happen, mark my words. Everything is wireless or Wi-Fi connected, this is the natural progression for our peripherals. It's also fast enough. At two to three milliseconds network latency across a home network, wired or Wi-Fi, that's just fine. Remembering the trainer only updates at four hertz, so 250 milliseconds. As a technical side note, you can plug this device directly into an ethernet port on a Mac and a PC, but I wouldn't call it directly connected. It still uses the IP stack to communicate in exactly the same way as it does on your home network at large. I would call this a secondary network of just two hosts. As we plug more and more things into our home network and eventually through to the internet, are there any security concerns with this? Not many that I can think of, to be honest. It's still just an endpoint peripheral. It's just a kicker. It's not going to be mining Bitcoins anytime soon, so I don't think it'll be an attack target. Is it calling home and sharing your data? Well, not that I saw, but your training apps definitely are. Uh, security is taken care of by your home network to get to the device in the first place, so have a strong Wi-Fi password. Look, anybody within Bluetooth range of a kicker will be able to connect to it anonymously and do interesting things. That's more of a concern than the IP connectivity of this new device. The single IP connection limit, while well, technically not a security feature, will stop any crossed wires, so to speak, if multiple people are on the network trying to pair to the same trainer. This does happen on occasion with both Ant Plus and Bluetooth. So look, I see this as a stopgap solution for what's eventually going to come our way, and it's set the groundwork to build upon that in the near future. What I think is coming in the future is up here. Now, I believe we should have Wi-Fi modules built into our trainers and smart bikes already. Look, $55 printers off the shelf already have Wi-Fi and multicast DNS advertising their services on our home networks. Ideally, it should be up in the five gigahertz range, so it might be a little bit more expensive than those printers, but it'll make things a lot easier than finding an ethernet cable, which is not supplied with this unit. I'd like to see smart trainers and smart bikes become a connection hub, pairing heart rate monitors, power meters, and steering devices, and then transmit them over IP, which the framework has been built here to use. I saw a trainer last week implement that for heart rate. It was very, very cool. As a bonus, I'd love to see a toggle switch that if we're using these IP connections or wireless connections in the future, we can switch off Ant Plus and switch off Bluetooth. That would stop anybody hijacking those connections in a, I guess, unprotected environment. Finally, onto the pricing before wrapping this one up for today. Coming in at 100 US dollars, 100 euros, 80 pounds, and just under 140 Australian dollars. So, is the Kicker Direct a must have? For me, unless you're having major dropout issues, no, not at this point in time. It's also too early to tell how well it works with the supportive softwares. But it's interesting to know it's out there, and I'd love to see this IP connectivity as a standard across the board for all smart trainers and smart bikes. It should, fingers crossed. Get rid of those dropouts we're having with those other protocols currently in use. All right, wrapping this one up for today. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you soon.